Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's information session. My name is Nicole Pratt. I am a senior trainer. I am the Empowering Women Project Coordinator and the Parent Engagement and TA Facilitator on the SPAN's Family Voices Leadership and Family Professional Partnerships Project at SPAN. I will be facilitating today's session with Jennifer Langer Jacobs, Assistant Commissioner for the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services in New Jersey, the Department of Human Services. Next slide. SPAN Parent Advocacy Network supports families as advocates and partners in improving education, health and mental health and outcomes for infants, toddlers, children and youth. We help families to know their rights, access to resources and information, and navigate systems that serve families across New Jersey. Our staff, including family resource specialists, parent group specialists, community health workers, and others are available to support families, educators, and family and health professionals by phone and by email during this crisis. I invite you to call our warm line 973-642-8100 for assistance and support. For today's session, all participants are in listen in only mode. Be sure to monitor the chat box for additional information and resources that will be posted there. You can also use the chat to request assistance if needed. We also welcome your questions Please share them in the chat box as well. Although your specific question may not be answered to during today's presentation, it will be collected, shared with state agencies and departments, and used to inform future presentations. A link to access the handouts for today's session will be posted in the chat box. This presentation is being recorded and streamed to SPAN's Facebook page. The recording will be uploaded to SPAN's YouTube page, and the link will be shared on SPAN's website and our social media platforms. I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube page so that you can receive notification when this and other videos are uploaded. Check the chat box for the link to the subscribe. Next slide. We hope you and your families are all safe, and we thank you for joining today to hear the latest information related to COVID-19. We recognize the challenge that families are facing in these uncertain times. SPAN is making every effort to bring you relevant information and useful information. I am pleased to introduce to you our speaker for today, Assistant Commissioner Jennifer Langer Jacob, who will be sharing information with us on how New Jersey Family Care is working to support New Jersey residents' healthcare needs during the pandemic. Assistant Commissioner for the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services in New Jersey's Department of Human Services, Jennifer Langer Jacobs leads New Jersey's Medicaid program and the Children's Health Insurance Program, which together are known as New Jersey Family Care. Jennifer is passionate about making government programs work the best way possible for people they serve. Welcome, Jennifer, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. And how are you today? I am great, thank you. How are you, Nicole? I'm good. Good. Thanks for having me here. You're welcome. Um, well, shall we dive in? Yes, we should. Okay. Um, Thanks again for the opportunity to join you today. Uh, I have been working with New Jersey communities for uh, a long time. I started my career as a teacher in Jersey City. So I want to say hello to Hudson County families. And, um, and I have been working with New Jersey's communities since then, always trying to make sure that our programs are serving people the best way possible. And um, so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about our NJ Family Care Program. If you could take us to the next slide, we'll get started there. Thanks. Um, I always want to start conversations like this um, with this picture, this set of pictures, um, which represents the people we serve. Uh, we are focused on these families, uh, adults, grandparents, uh, all day, every day. 
Um, to be quite honest, uh, they keep me up at night and they get me out of bed in the morning. So uh, I always want to start here. Uh, and, it's, and it's really an unusual time right now, as you all know. Uh, everyone, everywhere, whatever they do, uh, is finding personal and professional challenges as a result of the current pandemic. And um, we certainly have been working through that uh, as a program. I want to talk to you a little bit about where we've been in this time. So if you could flip to the next slide, please. Um, you know, this is where we started. When uh, New Jersey's first case was reported on March 4th, we knew that it would be the first of many. Uh, we knew that the impact on our state, on our communities, and on our program would be substantial. We knew that our work would probably never be the same. And we thought that, um, you know, when you're stepping off into a chapter like that, you really need to make sure you know what you stand for. And uh, so we put together this set of principles that have guided us in our decision making, in, in managing our program through this experience. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time here, but I, I also really want to make sure that we point that out. Um, the very first thing we said was we will serve people the best way possible. And that really means supporting eligibility, ensuring that services are available, that we didn't have any major breakdowns in our Medicaid program. Um, during a time when people really need access to the health care that we provide. Um, we said that we need to make sure we're keeping our communication clear and simple. Um, that's important inside our organization because we're doing things we've never done before. And it's important in our communities because we can't assume that people will have had prior experience with anything we're talking about. It's just a very different reality. And so we wanted to make sure we focused on clear communication. Um, we said we're not going to be able to do things the same way. We will need to experiment with new ways to solve problems, and you'll hear a little bit about that uh, as I talk through some of the steps we've taken. We said it's really important to show people that we care. Um, there was a lot of work to do, and we could have powered through the work and got it all right and still not had people come away with the sense that we truly cared about them and we're trying to do this right. And so we wanted to emphasize that whether we're answering a phone or working on a, an analytical report, it needs to be clear that we're serving the people I showed you on the first page. And then finally, we recognized that among our staff, there was significant impact from this pandemic. People were personally impacted themselves, their homes, their families, their neighbors and friends, some of our colleagues. And, um, and we needed to recognize the impact that the pandemic was having across our organization and our partner organizations, frankly, and we'll talk a little bit about them too. Um, so I, I just wanted you to have a clear sense of where we we're coming from as we worked through this. And if you would flip to the next slide for me, um, I'll talk a little bit about what does it mean to serve people the best way possible during a pandemic? You know, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to know what it means. And um, so we thought about that in kind of three pieces, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these pieces. Um, the first was we needed to have a rapid response to the needs that we're developing on the ground immediately. And uh, so we started preparing uh, as soon as we heard the news uh, about the pandemic and other parts of the impact in other parts of the world. We knew it was coming here. We worked with the federal government on all the different pieces of our program that we knew would be impacted and the, and the flexibility that we would need during this time. All of that had to move very fast. Um, then we said, we also know that things are going to change and over time, the needs will evolve. We have to be planning for those. So right now, for example, we're in a conversation about what does testing look like in our communities? How will we handle prevention of the spread of the disease for the long term until we have a vaccine and, and solutions? And, uh, and so we didn't start those conversations you know, now. We started them three months ago, knowing that we would need to be where we are now. And, uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then in the course of, of the rapid response and also trying to be strategic about the needs going forward, make sure that we're thinking with our partners, using our technology different, um, and, and being as, as flexible and transformative as we can be in making sure that we have what we call velocity and stability in our program. Velocity meaning we've got to go, things have to get done, and stability meaning everybody has to get there in one piece. So could you flip to the next slide for me? 
three important pieces uh, of our work. The first one is about protecting and extending access to Medicaid coverage. Um, as, as you all know, the economy has taken a turn. And when the economy takes a turn to the negative, Medicaid takes a turn to the positive in terms of our membership. We had to prepare for onboarding new members and we need to make sure that people know how to join our program. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that today um, because I know that some people on the phone may in fact be eligible for our program. Others may be advocating for families and you want to know, and, and, I, think, and I think many of you know our program well. So, um, but I wanted to point out a few things. It's very common for people to use the paper application for NJ Family Care. It's not a great idea right now, right? We wanna help people stay home. And so the online application is really the best way to go right now. And the um, phone support is available through our 800 number. So um, you can get somebody to help you through the application if you need it. There's three ways to apply online for NJ Family Care. So I always wanna point that out because different families might take different paths. Um, NJ Helps is a really great resource because in addition to being a place where you can apply for NJ Family Care, it's also a place where you can screen for food assistance and cash assistance. So it's kind of three things in one. I like to send people there because it's an easy way to just cover all three of those bases. Um, another option for families who might have recently had commercial coverage um, or employer-based coverage and might be interested in the marketplace coverage that's available, uh, you can go to Get Covered NJ, and Get Covered NJ will help you access both the marketplace and NJ Family Care. Um, and then finally, you can just go straight to njfamilycare.org, and, um, and on our website, you, you do have access to the income eligibility guidelines, uh, which may surprise you, and, um, and we have a nice chart that's set up by household size. Um, NJ Helps is doing that for you. If you go on the NJ Helps site, it'll just screen that for you based on the income and your household size. But on our NJ Family Care website, you can figure out the same information. Um, an example of what might surprise you that wasn't the case, you know, a few years ago is um, the adult population. You know, it was always a moms and kids program. Then it grew to be a families program. Uh, we do cover seniors, but um, not everybody knows that we cover adults now. And so, for example, an adult living alone uh, with an income just over $1,400 a month would qualify for NJ Family Care. And again, you can go to those websites to get the information on how to apply and to fill out an online application. Let's flip to the next slide. We want you to know that there are some flexibilities that the federal government has made available to us during the disaster period. So we and other states have taken advantage of those. Um, that includes allowing, for example, allowing families to attest to their income and assets um, on the application. It's just a little bit easier path to getting people enrolled. Um, and then a lot of folks have asked us questions about federal stimulus payments that will not count as income for Medicaid purposes and um, neither will unemployment insurance increases coming through the federal uh, emergency provisions. So those don't count as income and, um, and we have made some changes in the background that let us move through application processing a little faster. So there's no question that um, the offices that process applications have been hit by the pandemic. Um, in the same way that the rest of your community has, but we're moving through applications faster and faster as everyone adjusts to the new normal and uh, the pace has picked up and we're moving people along to get them enrolled. Um, you may see Get Covered NJ ads running on television, radio, internet. Um, we're really trying to make sure that everyone is aware of the coverage that's available right now. And, um, and in particular, families who may have had a change in their insurance status. For example, if you got laid off from your job or, or, or otherwise lost your job, um, you lost that health care coverage, apply for NJ Family Care. You don't have to wait. Let's flip to the next slide. Um, this is a really important slide. I want to put big stars and hearts and rainbows on this slide. 
because it's a very important one. No one will lose coverage under the Medicaid and CHIP programs, our NJ Family Care program. No one will lose that coverage during the emergency period. The federal government has said everyone will maintain their eligibility during this period. And, uh, and we also suspended the premiums that some families pay for NJ Family Care. So no premium has been paid by those families since March. Um, the thing, the reason I really want to put hearts and stars on this slide is because the eligibility system for Medicaid is enormous and it processes thousands of cases every day, week, month. And um, it is possible that families or individuals could be told they have lost their eligibility. And that will not be the case, but it has happened. And I want you to know if you hear it, that you should flag it because we do not intend to be disenrolling and it's possible there's an error and we need to fix it and we want to fix it. So we're constantly working behind the scenes in the system to make sure that things are not going out the door as disenrollments. If you hear about a Medicaid disenrollment, your friend, your neighbor, yourself, call us and tell us you have this, you've seen this, you've heard of this, here's the situation, and we will take care of it because no one should be disenrolling during this emergency period. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the next important piece, so we talked a little bit about eligibility and enrollment. We gotta make sure people have healthcare coverage. Um, the next important piece is making sure that members get the care that they need. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about some changes that we've made and some work that our um, man managed care partners have done. Um, for COVID testing and office visits, there are no copays under the Medicaid and CHIP program and J Family Care. Um, we've also adapted a significant amount of our program to support social distancing. And, um, and, and so let me talk to you a little bit about that. We initially uh, reached out to pharmacies and through the health plans and we said, we want our members to be able to refill their prescriptions early. We want them to get a 90 day supply and we don't want you to have to sign at the pharmacy using the electronic pen that everybody else has touched. We, we really took steps as a state to, to try to avoid all of that. Um, so you can refill early, you can get a 90 day supply. Uh, telehealth, because of the emergency, we were able to relax some rules. And I think we've seen some really interesting developments with this as people have learned to, to, to use telehealth. And to be quite honest with you, I hadn't done it before myself until very recently. Um, so it took a little bit of like, oh, this is a change. Um, but I think, I think people have found it to be incredibly helpful um, that they can see a healthcare provider from their home. And the emergency flexibility we have is that you can use a regular phone. You can use FaceTime. Ordinarily, providers are required to use a HIPAA compliant platform. And, um, and that can be a little bit more of something to figure out. Uh, although I did it, I managed. Um, but for now, because of the emergency circumstances, this has been made as easy as possible and we're finding more and more people are taking advantage of that. Um, that does include treatment for mental health and substance abuse and providers are being paid the same as they would for an in-person visit. We, um, we did pull all of our face-to-face -face care management out of the field back in March. Uh, because we felt it wasn't safe for families or care managers to be having care managers going house to house, as you can imagine. Um, but managed care continues to provide telephonic care management to our families, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, for presumptive eligibility for Medicaid, which is um, someone who's presenting in a healthcare at a healthcare provider's office, a hospital, a federally qualified health clinic. Um, they think they might be eligible for Medicaid. The provider can do that assessment. And um, normally that would be face-to-face, -face, but under the circumstances, we're able to do it over the phone. And then, oh my gosh, all this emphasis on phones. We needed to make sure that everyone has access to a cell phone 
with minutes available. And um, so uh, you may be aware that cell phones are available for our Medicaid members through lifelinesupport.org, which is a, um, a federal program. Okay, let's flip to the next slide. Uh, so in New Jersey, we have a strong uh, transportation benefit for our members to be able to get to their appoint medical appointments. And um, that's through a company called Logisticare. Uh, when this all began, we had to get together with Logisticare and say, what protocols will you put in place for the safety of our members and your drivers? And, uh, and they have done that so that even if they need to transport someone who has a positive test for COVID-19 or has symptoms of COVID-19, they are prepared to do that. Um, that includes people who are coming and going from hospitals and people who are going to dialysis, doctor's appointments. Um, we have seen a drop in the, in the trips because people are opting out of voluntary uh, doctor's appointments, but essential trips like dialysis have continued at the same level that they were before. Um, if you were applying for a Medicaid fair hearing, this is a little bit in the weeds. Um, there's some extensions on deadlines because the courts had to close down. They couldn't be inviting people in in the same way. So they've sort of started back up again using uh, FaceTime and, and video technology. And uh, so we're getting a little bit back to normal there. Let's flip to the next slide. This is the part where um, we're really focused back on these families, right? These kids, these moms and dads, these grandmas and grandpas. Um, let's flip to the next slide. I just wanna go through these very quickly, but I want you to have a sense of what we expect our health plans, our managed care partners to do in support of the families we serve together. Um, so the first one is an example. This is all telephonic outreach now, right? We're not going out in the community during the pandemic, um, but we do have them dialing all day long. And, um, and so the first one is an example of a care manager who reached a member. Member had relocated and she couldn't get her infusion supplies delivered to her new home. So this was a sudden thing. It hadn't been anticipated. The care manager jumped in connected the member to a new provider and the infusion supplies get delivered to the new home. Very simple. Um, the next one though was a care, man care manager who reached out to a member who was identified as high risk because there was a recent kidney transplant. And she learned that he had tested positive for COVID-19 and had been sent home. But at home, he had a very high fever and she was concerned about that. So she connected him to his, she connected directly to his transplant team, and then they agreed that she needed to connect to emergency services and make sure that he got back to the hospital. Let's flip to the next slide. Um, the next one is an example of a mom with a, um, a, a child with complex care needs. Um, it, it wasn't a major emergency, but she had run out of Pediasure and that was stressing her. And the care manager reached out to the family doc. The family doc had some samples. The care manager expedited a delivery, took care of mom and the kid, um, and everything was, was fine for them going forward. Some of this is, you know what, it's not the biggest stuff in the world. It's just making sure that we don't have gaps in our system where people need a sense of continuity or need a problem solved. Um, another one was an example of a cancer survivor. She, they reached out to her. Um, because she was identified as high risk, living alone, and um, her personal care assistance services had stopped. And she had been alone for two days and she needed that help. So the care manager recognized the urgency of that issue, connected to a home health agency, got services started again the same day. That's the kind of intervention that we expect these nurses and social workers to be making. Let's flip to the next slide. These next couple um, were uh, the case of a mom who had recently given birth. She was doing fine, baby was fine. She just acknowledged that her care manager was the first person to reach out and check on her and check on her baby's wellness. And, um, and the next one, this, we saw many, many cases of, of food insecurity. And, and this is one example 
where um, the care manager connected to our member's daughter. Member has dementia. Um, the daughter is her personal preference worker, meaning she's there taking care of mom, um, providing her activities of daily living. Maybe she's bathing, dressing, preparing meals for mom. She, because of mom's dementia, she didn't feel like she could go out grocery shopping. As you know, that has not been an easy task. Um, so the care manager coordinated with a local volunteer organization for a grocery delivery to hold her over until the next time that she could get to the grocery store. Let's flip to the next slide. I think we have a few other um, just food related issues here. Uh, this one was a man on dialysis living with his young son. And again, the, the, the grocery issue was presenting a problem. Um, you know, making sure that we address the cultural needs of our members is really important. So in this case, um, he needed meals that were um, on the halal diet. And the care manager found a local organization that was able to partner with her um, to get some food out to him, both a meal immediately and, um, and then groceries to support him through the, through the week. And then finally, we talked about telehealth a few minutes ago. Um, a lot of us are doing telehealth for the first time. Like I said, I'm one of them. And, uh, and so a care manager on the phone with a high-risk member. Um, member didn't want to go to the doctor. I need to talk to my doctor, but I don't want to go. And the care manager coordinated that telehealth visit so that member um, could see her doctor from home. And uh, you know what? When, when the world is changing all around us every day, sometimes we need a hand. And, uh, and that, was, that was an important step for that care manager to take with that member. So I think if we flip to the next slide, I think that's um, one more grocery delivery. Um, and in this case, this member was not connected to SNAP and that was important. So the care manager made sure that they went over her SNAP eligibility and, and made a plan for the long term. Let's go to the next slide. Here, we, I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the partnerships that we've set up to help us kind of get through the situation uh, with our communities. Um, we have flexed on the site of service uh, as much as we possibly could. An example of that being if you would normally be um, in a provider's office for a particular kind of therapy, that you would be able to, in fact, do that from home as much as possible, as long as the standard of care allows it. And um, for medical daycare programs that serve many of our older adults, and, and we have pediatric programs as well, um, we enabled them after they closed their sites, which was necessary, um, we enabled them to continue to support our families. And we really relied on them as partners um, for doing check-in calls, delivering meals, and coordinating with the health plans to make sure people had the support that they needed at this time. Um, Logisticare helped us out. We amended our contract with them so that they could deliver groceries and food and actually help us transport home health aides to members' homes. And um, that was a concern for folks because the home health aides were traveling on public transportation often. And um, that's additional contact points, possibility of of connection with the virus and then transmitting it across multiple households. And so we thought, let's work with Logisticare to just as much as possible, try to get aid straight to members' homes um, in, in Logisticare's cabs instead of on public transportation. Um, so that's a program we kicked off. And, um, and then we've been working with pharmacies and the federal government as we have seen this thing evolving, um, which, which feels like just a daily change, right? Um, but as things are shifting, we're trying to make sure that we're, we're ready and shifting with it. Can we flip to the next slide? We've fast-tracked provider enrollment. Um, I won't go into too much detail on that, but just, just for some folks, it's relevant that if you uh, previously had personal care assistance in your home through a home health agency, and you didn't want to do that during the pandemic, we made it possible to fast track a family member for that PCA um, so that we could avoid having aides coming and going from the home if family was say home from work and available to provide that care. So um, that fast track has been something a lot of folks have taken advantage of. 
And then we just relax some of the business as usual stuff. We usually have a lot of auditing that we have to do, um, some prior authorization process at the health plans where we just said, hey, we need to take a step back from, from things that are normally part of our operation to make sure that everyone's getting what they need during this difficult time. Uh, let's flip to the next page. So we talked at the beginning about um, rapid response. Some things had to be done right away. Um, we had to do some planning for the future and we had to think differently and solve problems in new ways. And, um, and our work continues on that. So we're, th we're three months down the road now, getting close to four, goodness. And, um, and we have been expecting that our enrollment will continue to grow. We have been working to adapt to the new uh, testing protocols, treatment protocols. Um, how do we make sure everyone has the PPE they need to feel safe? And, um, and then really thinking about um, health equity and social determinants of health in this new world, making sure that for the community that we serve, we are in fact doing it the best way possible. Um, so that means continuing to be out there talking with parents like you, talking with the advocates, making sure that you know, we are just as much a part of the public dialogue as we can be, hearing the voices of the people we serve, um, bringing them into our conversations, you know, inviting them to the table as we're thinking about different steps we might need to take from a policy point of view. So conversations like this one are really important to me. And, uh, and I just wanna say, since my days as a teacher in Jersey City, I taught fifth grade, my fifth graders who were, let's say 10 at the time are 30 something now with children of their own. Um, since, my, since my days uh, as a teacher in Jersey City, I have known SPAN as a tremendous advocate for families statewide. And so I'm thrilled to be here with you today and just really glad to be part of, part of the conversation. Looking forward to you know, hearing voices and, and talking about some of the challenges we're all facing together. So there I would give it back to you, Nicole. Well, I really want to thank you for such great information. And I am from Hudson County, uh, <laughs> from Jersey City. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah, migrated over six years ago to Mercer. Wow. Um, so, yeah, that warmed my heart. Um, <laughs> but I really want to thank you for the information. I think it's really vital that Medicaid, which is such a large system, um, here in New Jersey that supports so many programs and especially healthcare for families, um, that it was able to modify the way you implemented doctor's appointments and transportation and all those other things that are necessary for families to have um, in their life. So I really think, want to thank you for that information. Um, do you see that, I don't, are there any questions in the chat box? And I didn't look at it. There are no questions at this time. Okay. All right. Um, I do have a question. Do you see if or that the system, the way you have it set up due to COVID-19 is going to continue for a bit right now? Just I to keep everyone safe? That's a really good question. It's something we're looking at um, right now <laughs> because the there are flexibilities that we've been able to take advantage of because of the national declaration of a public health emergency, mm -hmm. um, that opens up new opportunities with respect to federal rules. Right. That will close when that national public health emergency closes. Okay. So then what we have to do is figure out what would we like to continue mm -hmm. um, if that public health emergency ends, and we know this public health emergency in New Jersey will continue. Right? right, it's not going away. Yes. Um, yeah. So if that national designation ends and we lose access to some of that flexibility, how will we continue it going forward? And so we're evaluating each of the things we've done to say, how important has this been? And what do we need to do to maintain it going forward? So that is work in progress right now, Nicole. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, I always say the two biggest systems that are vital to families is health and education. Yeah. 
because if we are not healthy, if we don't have access to health care, we obviously cannot get our children to school um, that's it. to be healthy and have their health services met in school as well. Um, so that's, they're just, they're so vital and they're just so important. Um, I get chills just thinking about it because I'm always talking to parents about it. I'm like, healthcare and education, two large systems, and we must, must work together. And um, that families understand that they have a health system that is here to support their family and their children. And outside of a child, you know, having some immigrant status, there really should be no child without health care. Yeah. You know, for adult or a family, it's here and there's access to it. It's um, here. And, e and, and all of our families can go to the federally qualified health centers. Exactly, yeah. Right? Now, did you see a rise in um, applications because of COVID-19 with people possibly losing their jobs or losing their health care? We have seen an increase in our membership. Um, not as dramatic as you might expect, especially huh. because we saw such a dramatic increase in um, in SNAP applications. Oh, okay. Yeah, right, right. We think that people are focused on food first, uh -huh. <laughs> which makes sense. Right. Um, they're right. not taking their kids to the pediatrician right now if they can avoid it. Right. right. So we're, st we're expecting to see a similar increase as what SNAP saw. Yeah. Um, but people have prioritized the, the SNAP benefits first. Which is understandable, yeah, that, which is very understandable. But eventually, mm -hmm. you know, the health care um, needs to be looked at and considered and um, to get people to be healthy. Yes. Um, and, you know, I've heard many stories on the news um, that people really did put aside that health care, but it also put people at risk. Yeah. Um, um, and I heard some awful stories about women, you know, not recognizing signs of a heart attack. And she decided, well, I Jordan was just feeling something and decided I'm not going to the doctor. And then after two or three months decided to go and the doctor said you were having a heart attack. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I say that to say that even though we are in a pandemic, it's still really vital that we go to the doctor, get our health care. If you don't have health insurance, contact New Jersey Family Care, you know, take care of yourself. Absolutely. Prenatal care. Prenatal. We, need our, we need our moms going to the doctor. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and, and for, for many of us, a telehealth visit will get it done. Yes. You know? Yes. I was, I was amazed. I thought, Gosh, I'm, I'll never go back, right? If I can avoid it, it was, I never got up from my desk. I talked to my doctor, I was done. It was amazing. Yeah, you know, and then for children with special health care needs, you know, as you know, we work a lot of families with a variety of children and young adults with special health care needs and how important for them to have their Medicaid. And as we know, um, young adults, you know, uh, when they turn 18, um, if they are going to be getting services from the developmental disability system that they have to have Medicaid and, you know, whether they got it through Social Security with their SSI and their Medicaid or they have to apply, you know, for that system to order yeah. to get services. So that's really important that they ensure that they have their health insurance. Yes. Because there's a and lot more things going on. And there are a lot of services provided through the Division of Developmental Disabilities mm -hmm. um, for our, for our uh, young adults and, and children with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Right. So, you know, it, that's an incredibly complex system with a lot it's of perfect. services, not my expertise. Right. Um, but they have done a lot of flexing as well during this period just to make right. sure that everyone is getting the care and services that they need. Right, and so those support. If I could just step in for a moment, I do have a question that someone asked. Um, they would like to know, is there a long wait or delay to get um, services? She, this person, Forster, is a, a Forster, she fosters children and um, through DC PMP, and the kids are not getting their cards. Kids have not gotten their cards. Um, you know what? Cards? We have, let's see, we, it, it often depends on the, the county and the circumstances. So it would really help me if we could get the specific information from that family so that I can follow up. Um, we've I had some- I safely Gloucester County? Gloucester, okay. I don't, know, I don't know any specific issues at Gloucester that I could describe to you. 
Um, but I can absolutely look into that specific case if you can get a private message with their, with their information. Um, alternatively, they could call our 800 number if right. they don't want to share the information with you now. You know, I'll just put the 800 number in the chat if you can. Um, I mean, I'm sure we've posted it already, but if you can give it to me again real quick. Yep, it's 1-800-701-0710. Okay, thank you very much. If sure. that person has any more questions, um, you can either put it in the chat or send it to me privately. That's fine and I will share. Thank you. Yep. And we wanna remind people that um, from your information, we created, well, Lauren, I did not. Lauren did, created a fact sheet, a Medicaid fact sheet that um, SPAN is also providing to families. And I believe the link was shared in the chat box. Um, because again, we want to make sure that everybody has the most updated information um, from Medicaid, from all offices, you know, like I said, with SNAP and all those offices. We had SNAP at lat the couple days ago, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. So um, I so thought that was a great fact sheet, by the way. Really well done. Yeah, yes, it was. All right. Well, I want to thank you again if there's no more questions. And we really appreciate the very valuable information that you shared today. And I really would like to take the opportunity to give my sincere thanks for really all the hard work that you're doing um, in the Medicaid system and taking care, taking time out of your very busy schedule. Um, and just providing this really valuable information. And thank everyone who joined today, either by Zoom or by Facebook. And the recording to today's session will be posted to our website, YouTube page, and various social media platforms for future viewing.